Psalm 127 says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, and what is a city but a collection of homes? Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wakes but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up and go to bed at night, eat the bread of sorrow, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hands of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is that man who has his quiver full. Now listen to this last part. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. That's the part that I want to focus on tonight. And we're going to talk about parenting tonight. And I, I love to talk about this. It does not mean or imply that I have any particular expertise in this. I, I understand the fact that, that children are different. And I understand that there are challenges beyond our control sometimes to the rearing of our children. And I understand that it's, it's uh, considered proper for somebody that's as old as me when talking about parenting to, to start by saying, uh, I, I used to think I knew something about parenting and then I got older and I realized I don't know anything about this. Well, I don't think that. What scares me about that is that if we're not careful, our preachers aren't going to talk much about this for fear that they would show themselves ignorant. And that's a mistake, I think. But get the last part of this verse. They shall not be ashamed. It's talking about the rearing of our children, and it's talking about being with the enemies in the gate. But our children are not ashamed. That is to say, they know who they are. They're not, they're not embarrassed or ashamed of who they are. They're different, mind you, but they're not ashamed of that, even when they're with the enemies in the gate. What is your goal in the raising of your children? And some of us have grandchildren, and isn't that nice? Don't we like having grandchildren? Cindy and I have five of them now, and every one of them, uh, just like Brother Blackwell's saying, every one of them is just all right, really good, really good. What's your goal? What do you think, the, what, what should be the goal of, of children, when raising your children? What should be the goal? And it's not difficult. The goal is to raise happy, faithful, productive Christians. Ready? Happy, faithful, productive Christians. To raise children that don't flinch when asked the question, what is true success? True success is living your life and going to heaven. True failure, no matter what else is true, is living your life and going to hell, right? Isn't that it? What I want to do, as time will permit, is give you five matters that I think are very important if we want to raise our kids like that. To not be ashamed. How do you do it? What kinds of practical things could we talk about to raise our children in the Lord? Here we go. Number one, matters of knowledge. And of course, Ephesians 6, 4 is familiar to all of us. Fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Or Proverbs 22 and 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. If there was one thing that I could point to that is so critical about raising our children with Bible knowledge, it would be family Bible time at night. Now you can do it some other time of the day, I don't care, but, but having family Bible time is just huge. We've been talking about some things tonight that are rather scary, and I, I really appreciate these two brothers presenting the kinds of things that they have. And we know that the dangers are there, and we're raising uh, our children. Those of you who have young children have a particularly important task in front of you. And it was underscored tonight in some of these discussions, and that is that things are changing very rapidly. And you must bear in mind that, that the freedoms, our religious freedoms, are going to be sacrificed on the altar of homosexual rights. I do not know when that will be, but I predict that it will, it will happen because they cannot tolerate us, because we won't tolerate that. It's not that we don't love people. We love everybody, no matter what their temptations are. And James says that every man's tempted of his own lust, and you have temptations, and I do. We don't hate anybody. But we also can't endorse the sin of homosexuality, and there's a dramatic impasse that's, that's happening with reference to that. What will tomorrow look like? I urge that churches ought to start now in their young classes. I don't mean every week, but I, I mean from time to time. We need to make sure that our children understand Christianity in times of persecution because it will come. The fact that we've had a couple of hundred years here in this wonderful country of ours with religious freedoms is rather an anomaly, isn't it? Isn't it? 
that Christianity could be lived in this kind of free atmosphere. I mean, I'm not afraid tonight. I'm not a bit afraid tonight. Isn't that something? We, we get to worship in the kind of relaxation that we enjoy, and we frankly have raised up a couple of generations, and we all just rather take it for granted, but we shouldn't, and we ought to teach the children now. We ought to prepare them now. I'm not a radical. I don't believe I am. Or, or an alarmist. I just want to say that, that you don't have to use your imagination very much now to picture what persecution would look like against Christians because it's just not so very far away. Now, that's why lessons like these tonight are so important, and this one, I think, is very, very important. So how do we raise godly children, are you ready for this, that are not ashamed to sit with the enemies in the gate? The first thing's gonna have to be knowledge, and, and what I wanna recommend, of course, is Bible classes, that we bring them faithfully to Bible class and worship, but the, this crowd tonight doesn't need to be told that. You got that. But I'm thinking about when I was growing up, and, and I was reared in the Church of Christ, and you know what, we had some classes growing up that were better than others. I, God bless the Bible class teachers. But the fact is, sometimes the class was too large and we were too rowdy. Not me, of course, I never did anything like that. I probably was the ringleader of it, I don't know, but. And sometimes I think the teachers maybe had, I don't know, different, different skill levels or whatever. I just, I'm just saying that, that there were years when the classes in Bible classes in the church were better than others, and that's just naturally. I love all of our Bible class teachers. But look, whatever, whatever they're getting in those Bible classes needs to be on top of what you're training them at home. What I want to encourage all of you who have small children at home is to adopt this practice religiously, no pun intended. Every night before you put them to bed, you need to have a family Bible time with them. At our house, we called it story time. We started it before they were born. They cannot remember a time that we did not do it, and you have to do it every night, because if you don't, you'll up and have six months pass, and you'll say, wow, we ought to really get back to that, because you'll, you'll miss it. It's got to become a habit. It's got to be done habitually. And, and in the family Bible time, you try to keep it interesting. You don't just let it become dull, and it's not just daddy reading from the Bible, and I'm not opposed to that, of course, but. But what we want to do is, is work in a very practical way to take the principles of the Scripture and put them in those children. So some nights you're going to play a game. Sing a song together and play a game and, and say, now we're going to play 20 questions and I'm a person in the Old Testament or the New Testament and let them ask their questions until they can find out who that person is. Or sometimes you're going to take them to the kitchen and put them on the floor and you're going to say, like Simon says, and, and if you get the answer right, you get to scoot two scoots this way, and if you get the answer wrong, you, you know, and then whoever gets here first gets this magnificent prize. And the magnificent prize is that you get to, you, you get to stay up five minutes longer than your sister, right? And, and that's what we're, what we're going to do is to make it interesting. You ought, to, you ought to get involved with Lads to Leaders, and part of Lads to Leaders is that we want children to memorize 100 verses of Scripture in the course of a year. So don't you say, are you going to go on vacation this summer sometime or next summer sometime? You're going to go to the Grand Canyon. Well, don't waste the Grand Canyon. What you ought to do is to say, we'll go on this wonderful vacation, but only if every person in the family can memorize these hundred verses. In Last Leaders, we do them sometimes. You can either do them in blocks of 10, two blocks of 50, or be really brave and get the centurion of Scripture, hundred verses at one time. You know more verses than you know that you do. What if you just drew them up, Dad? Do draw them up, and, and, and the whole family spends the time memorizing the same hundred verses of Scripture, and then everybody gets it right, and you're, you're encouraging each other, and then you go on vacation. And wouldn't that be great? What are you doing? I'm training my children in knowledge because they're going to need it. They will need it. I would suggest in family Bible time that we do a daddy list. Now, this is applicable to those of us who are grandfathers, too. You could do a granddaddy list. The daddy list is simply this. Get a piece of paper and, and write the list of the things that you want to make sure that you're sure that you're sure that you, your children know before they grow up and leave you. See, they're not going to get it like you get a cold. It's not going to get through osmosis. The, the Bible knowledge of practical things for their lives will come from their hero who is you. You're already the hero. You just have to act like it. What, if you, what would you put on the list? What would you put on the list of the things that you want to make sure that your children know before they grow up and leave you? I want them to know about one true church, right? 
and understand what the scripture, I want them to know the conversion examples so that they're very familiar. They're, they, they're close friends with the Ethiopian and, and Lydia and the jailer and Cornelius. They're very close friends with those people. They know them well. I want them to know that there's a heaven and a hell. I want them to know that, that, that the world was created in six literal days and then God rested. I want them to know that from the scripture. What do you want them to know? I want them to know the principles of honesty. I want them to know what's wrong with telling a lie. Why is it wrong? And what happened to people in the scriptures who lied? How did that turn out? Well, it turned out badly. And it'll turn out badly for you too. What if daddy makes the list? Now, I'm not saying that you're only going to have one story time that's about that. You may have several of them through the course, I'm sure you will, the course of their growing up. But what if, what if on three nights of the week, you choose one, Dad, and you say, tonight, we're going to talk about marriage. And, and you do it on, a, on their level, where they understand it, right? What are you doing? I'm training my children in the Bible. Now, we've got, we got to figure out about matters of knowledge. Here's the second one, matters of fidelity. Now, there's two particular areas that I want to talk about in reference to fidelity. The first, and this won't surprise you. The first one is the church. When your children grow up and leave you, will they be faithful to the church? Now, I understand that there's some things that are going to be beyond your control. I understand that. And I understand that through my life, I've known some great, great people, and everything I saw pointed to that there were great parents. And sometimes children become unfaithful. I completely understand that. At the same time, I want to encourage young parents to keep on trying. And here's some ideas. That's what I want to do. Let's talk about practical things that you can do to help your children to grow up, be faithful to the Lord and to His church. Fidelity to the church. So Proverbs 22 and 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. What does training mean as opposed to teaching? Well, they're not the same thing. You could teach a boy how to play baseball by giving him a book about baseball and letting him read it. You're teaching him that. But training, I see training, that's a different matter. You take him out in the yard and you say, son, hold it like this. And when you throw it, I want you to point your fingers like that at your target. Now I want you to hold the bat like, no, 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 hold it like this. Right, that's right. Now choke up on the bat a little bit higher. That's it. Now let's try it. No, swing up. When you hit it, do it, do it this way. What are you doing? I'm training. Train up a child in the way he should go. We're going to teach them loyalty to the church. We're, not, we're going to come to the assemblies. I, I had a lady, a, a sister about my age in the church recently who said, Glenn, we were there growing up. We were there every time the doors were open. Right. That's right. Let me tell you something. There's a difference between families who raise their kids like that and families who don't. Somebody said to, to Cindy and me one day, well, now, we're, we're members of the church, but now in the summer we play ball. See, that's different. That's a different way of raising your kids. I'm not opposed to ball, but you, you understand the point. I, I, would, I, I think that what, what we ought to do, parents, when we plan a vacation in the summertime, we ought, to, we ought to sit down. Now that we have computers, it's much easier. Get your computer and Google where you're going with your children. I mean before you figure out the theme park you're going to or what hotel you're going to stay at, and let's figure out where the church meets in that town. Now here's, we, here's where we can worship on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. We can worship right there. And, and look, look here, I, they support the Gospel Broadcasting Network. You know they're faithful, right? I thought I'd get an amen from that one. <laughs> uh, but you see the point. There's a difference in a family. That's, a, that's different. It's, it's, it's uh, not less. This is more. This is better. Because there's a difference between a family that says, we're going to go on vacation, and when we get there, you know what, I sure do hope we can find us a church when we get there. Now, see, that's one way to train the kids. I don't believe it's the best way. Why don't we plan for that? Let's make sure we plan for that, because we're people who are there when the doors are open. That's how we do it in our family. Now, I'm talking about loyalty to the church. What you ought to do is to have spiritual family projects that you do in your family that are, that are separate from what everybody else does. Now, I'm in favor of the, the projects and programs in the church that we do to do good together as a, as a united body. Those are right things to do. But in addition to that, you ought to, some Saturdays, take your kids. In the morning now, we need to get up early because we're going to go to Sister Brown's house. She's one of our widows. 
and we're going to take the ladder and we're going to take some trash bags, we're going to clean our gutters and sweep the leaves and trim our hedges. Right? And then one of your children may say, Daddy, I want to go, but how much are we going to get paid? That's a teaching opportunity right there. What we're going to get paid is the joy of helping a widow woman in the church. And I tell you, the Lord smiles on people who takes care of his widows, and that's what we're going to do tomorrow. Spiritual family projects. Now, we're going to talk about allowance in a few minutes. When, when your children start having their own money, I, I, like, I think it's a wonderful thing to, to give them money to put in the plate. That creates a habit. But as soon as you can get out of that, the better. By that I mean when they have their own money and they're contributing from their own money, then you're, you're doing a lot better. That's a, that's a better thing. They're learning how to sacrifice for the Lord monetarily, and that's, that's really a great thing. What if, what if you go to the elders of the church and you say, I, I want to talk about our missionaries and which one is it that you think could use the most encouragement? Because I want our family to get involved in that. So for your, your family Bible time, you sit down and you write the missionary a letter and let your children ask questions and, and let them give some of their allowance. Let's send, I'm, Daddy's going to send, Mama's going to send some money. Would you like to send him some money? Because I know he could use it. And they, they will. Those children will. And then before long what's going to happen is you're going to get letters back from the missionary. He's going to talk about things that they did with that money and how many people were baptized last year. And this month we baptized three more precious souls into Christ. And you watch your children be excited about that because they had skin in that game. With me? It's part of your family Bible time at night. Some nights you're going to be talking about our family missionary. I know his name. I know his wife's name. I know his kids' names. I know what they like to play, and I've sent them gifts because they are our missionary. What we're, what we're going to teach is, is fidelity to the church, but let's go on. Let's teach fidelity to the family. What are you doing right now to teach your children loyalty to your family? We can get so busy. This can happen so easily. It's not that we're involved in, in sinful things. It's that we're just too involved in, in, in superficial things. Things that just cry out for our attention all the time and, and before long why it just consumes us. And we forget some of the more important things such as teaching real loyalty and fidelity to the family. Are you aware of the fact that, that kids are, I mean, if they bother to get married at all, that, that kids are marrying later and later in life? I think there's probably a number of reasons for that. Sometimes it's, it's a non-issue. Sometimes it's just personal preference. Nothing wrong with that. Sometimes it's because they're not waiting for sex. And so that passion that Cliff talked about, not a, not a big issue. If you uh, have been sexually active sometime, why should you get married? And sometimes it's because of feminism. She doesn't need a, a, a breadwinner and he doesn't need a homemaker. We're all so terribly equal, aren't we? Right? And sometimes it's because kids have grown up to equate marriage with divorce. And why would I want to put put myself through that. I watch my parents do that. I want no part of it. And what, what all that spells is a lack of a sense of fidelity to the family. Don't minimize the importance of your family being in worship every time. Don't minimize the importance of sitting down together night after night at the supper table together. When I reflect on my children growing up and the best times, the best times, I don't think about Six Flags. We did some of that and that was a lot of fun. But when I think about it, I think about the supper table and sitting with Caleb and Hannah at the supper table and those conversations we had at the supper table. And if you, aren't, have you, if you hadn't already done it, what I want you to do is to make a rule in your family that we do not use the cell phone at the table. We just don't do it. It's against the rules. Unless, unless there's some emergency and somebody's bleeding or about to die, we think, you could use it then. Or if it's, or if it's to look up something that contributes to the conversation going on at the table, I think you could do it then, just to, to support the conversation. But otherwise, let's just don't do it. Don't, you know, do you, 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 does it make you nervous that I'm talking about a cell phone and you're not looking at one right now? If so, you're a little bit addicted. I'd just like to say that. Maybe addicted, a little bit nervous, need to check face, FaceTime, right? And check Facebook, and texting. Maybe I got a text. You, we're going we're gonna to rule the day. We will rule the day when our children are grown, especially if they up and leave the faith. 
that we, that we use that cell phone at the supper table because we would have been having conversation together if we weren't doing that. Sometimes a daddy or a mama is close enough to touch but not close enough to talk to. We ought to create traditions in our families. I, I want you to put real stock in holidays. There are things that, that we did when my children were kids that, that, that means, a, means a great deal, little silly things that Cindy and I just up and did, you know, that didn't amount to very much. But our, at Christmas time, there's these lights that I made out of these freezer containers. And, and I'd put them on little pieces of wood, and it didn't amount to anything. I don't suppose I expected, if I had known that they were going to uh, be used this long, I'd have done a better job creating them. But, but Hannah wants them. She doesn't want me not to put those up. She wants them put up every year because it's part of our tradition. And we have a bunch of them. Create traditions because you're creating a fidelity to the family and your children need to grow up understanding that everybody else is them and we are us. I have a, a grandson now that's just turned one, Caleb and Becca, and, and they are living now in Jackson, Tennessee. And now we bought, we have bought Ellis, Glenn, Collie, a rifle. I told you he's already turned one, so we waited a little long for this. <laughs> but we bought him a rifle. And, and all of his, he has one daddy and, and two granddaddies. And then he has some great granddaddies. And everybody participated in the purchase of that gun for that little baby. And every one of us will have shot it once. And every one of us wrote in this little book that came with that Henry rifle. And on the occasion of his wedding, Whoever's around, I hope it's me, will tell him that story and give him that gun. This came from your father's, son. And you take our name and you do good with it. You make the name better than it was when you got it. And what are we doing? We're creating a sense of fidelity, a sense of duty, a sense of loyalty to our children. Number three, it is the matter of discipline. Now, you're familiar with Ephesians 6 and verse 4. And fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Nurture includes discipline. We had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. We gave them reverence. It's interesting to me that the Hebrews writer there just, just assumes that that's what they did. Those Hebrew Christians, that's what they did. We had, did we? I don't think you could say it today as well. You know, We had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. Did we? Do we? I'd like to think so. Spanking is a good thing. I never make too many, many friends with children when I say this, but spanking's a good thing. You know, no, cho no chastening for the present seems to be joyful, but grievous. Notwithstanding, afterwards it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 9. You believe that? I, I do. I, I believe that. Spanking ought to be reserved. For, not, not for when you're teaching a child something the first time. You, you, you save that for when, when the child knows what he's doing is contrary to his father's or his mother's will, but he's choosing against that will. I think spanking can be a wonderful thing. And sometimes people don't believe in discipline. Maybe it's because they tried it at one time and they failed, didn't seem to work out. Maybe it was because when they were kids they didn't get any discipline. They just never learned how to do it. Or maybe they just are somehow philosophically opposed to it. Let's make some rules for discipline. One, don't yell at your children. Don't yell at them. You don't want your children to obey you because you're loud and out of control. You want them to obey you because you're daddy or your mama. Make it like that. You, you must obey me because I'm your dad. That's why. And I know I don't have to explain myself to you. I just tell you to do it. Because one day, they're going to have to decide about serving God. And, and they need to know that even if something God requires doesn't make so much good sense to them, they need to obey it anyhow. And where's the best place to learn that? Don't, don't yell at them. Don't lie to them. If you, this is applicable to 
things that are happy and things that are not so happy. If you, if you promise that boy that next Thursday I'm going to take you fishing, then you break your neck to get there. You just make sure that you do that. If you have some customer come in, something at the last minute, what you say is, I'm sorry, I have an appointment that I must keep because your credibility with him is at stake or your credibility with her is at stake. You make sure that you keep your word. Some, some daddies now are doing the opposite of that and they're gonna pay for that. They will and it won't be happy. You be sure that if you promise discipline that you administer that. Do it. You, if you promised it and the behavior continued and you said if it continues I'm gonna spank you, then you be sure that you deliver that. Do you know why? Of course you do. It's because, because if you don't, next time, and there will be a next time, your, your child's not going to be so bothered by your threats because you're a liar and he knows you're a liar. Don't count to your children. If anybody in here is doing this, I don't know it. I didn't hear anybody doing it, but I know that it's, oh, it's pretty common, I think. You, so you say, honey, I want you to pick up those shoes and put them in the closet. And she ignores you like, you're, like she's just deaf. And, and so you know, here's what we say. One, two, you know, we go into fractions, two and a half. And we kind of ease that into it, and eventually, you know, she'll get up and put up the shoes. I don't, I don't understand why we should do that. Why don't we just do it the other way and, and teach a good lesson in the process? Did you hear what I said? I said, you put up your shoes. You know, go, go do it. Now, don't abuse your children. Spanking delivered at appropriate times and appropriate measures by loving gentle parents is from heaven. Child abuse is from hell sexual, physical, spiritual, whatever kind it is. It's wrong. Don't lose teachable moments. Next one, the matter of money. Ephesians 4 and 28 is rather pointed, I think. Let him that stole steal no more, but let him labor with his hands that thing which is good that he may have to give to him that has not. I want to teach my children how to save. I want to teach them how to control credit. Teach your children how to control credit and one day your son-in-law or your daughter-in-law is going to really love you. Really love you because you will have raised somebody that can handle credit and know how to not abuse it. So the principle that Paul is teaching here in Ephesians chapter 4 is that, is that when somebody's in need, it'd be a wonderful thing if you have the ability to share with them to take care of those needs. But that implies that you're saving. It implies that you have the wherewithal because you've been working hard. And I know there's some extreme circumstances, but this is a general principle and it's right. And, and I, I need to be able to help those who don't have. And that would be a wonderful thing to be able to do. How do you, how do you teach that? Allowance is a good thing, I think. I, I think that, that giving your children allowance is fine with the principle behind it of teaching them how to handle money. Not pay. pay paying them for a chore in the house is something that ought to be really uh, few and far between. Put, g give them chores and expect them to do them, do them well, right? Put them on the refrigerator and everybody in this house, if you're part of this family, then you've got a responsibility. And this, th there it is on the refrigerator. Mom has, dad has, the kids have, everybody has to carry their part because we're a family. And what it does, they may not enjoy the, the work, but what it does is to teach them Good, good work practices, and it also teaches them belonging. It teaches them they belong to this family. We're us, right? And occasionally you'll, you'll have a special job and you might pay them something for that, but allowances to teach them how to handle money, not to pay them for chores. We do that because we're part of the family. Teach them about contribution, contributing to the Lord's work. As soon as they're making a dollar, they need to be contributing from that dollar even if it's allowance. You say, well, yeah, but they don't make much. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. The truth is that, that, that you're not gonna let them go hungry. You're not gonna let them go naked. You're not gonna let them go without a roof over their heads. This is training, right? I like the idea of a daddy bank. And so get, make a little bank book and say, let me teach you about saving and about interest. And so you can put the money, and you, you made some allowance. Well, what if you put half of it each week into the daddy bank, and I'll pay you 10% interest compounded monthly. Wouldn't you like some of that? Huh? Wouldn't you like some of that? 
but it's easy to calculate, right? So if they have a dollar in there, when we pay the interest, it's gonna be a dime. And now you got a dollar ten, just, it's just because you sa saved your money. And suddenly you're teaching them something very important. And one of these days, your son or your daughter's gonna come and say, I want to buy this, and it's absolutely frivolous. You know, 4th of July is coming. Daddy, I want to buy fireworks with my money. Well, okay, well, how much of it do you want? All of it? You, well, you've saved up $42.17. It says it right here in your bank book. You, you don't mean you want to spend all of it on fireworks. All of it. No, son, I can't let you do that. Because you know what? It'll be gone. You've worked hard to save this money. No, you can't do it. And then the child's going to say this. Now, this is going to happen sometimes, sometime in your children's growing up. You can't tell me not to do it because that money's mine. And so your response, I guess, would be, you're right, I'm sorry. What was I thinking? Of course you could. That's not what you're going to say. You're gonna, this is the speech that you're going to make. Son, let me explain. You belong to me. God gave you to me, and everything that appertains to you belongs to me. Your nose belongs to me. Your ears belong to me. Your, your, your chin belongs to me. And that bedroom in there belongs to me. And your chest of drawers and your t-shirts and your blue jeans and your shirts, it all belongs to me. Everything belongs to me because I'm your daddy, right? And, and I'm helping you grow up to be a godly man. I want you to be a great Christian or to your daughter to be a great Christian woman. And so I'm, I'm going to help you do all those things. And I'm going to take care of you because I love you with all my heart. We're going to teach them about money. Now, let's do morals and then I'll stop. It's the matter of morals. This, this could go very broadly, I know that. But right now we're in a tremendous battle in reference again to some of the things that have been talked about tonight. A terrible battle for the hearts of the children. And if you, if you think that this homosexual transgender stuff, if you think that it's not targeted in a massive way toward children, then you haven't been paying attention. We had the slide tonight about this Pixar movie. This is for just for children. And it had two women kissing on it. And, and people think that's the greatest thing since popcorn, that that's just wonderful. And what we now, in our mo more illuminated world, we need to expand on that. Excuse me, that's for children. We have some transgender people going into schools, elementary schools, and doing presentations to children. Now, why would they do that? Why do children, why do they think children need to learn about that? It's because it's from hell. The devil has no regrets. He doesn't. He doesn't care how he hurts people, how he destroys people's lives. And so what we're going to do as parents is, is we're going to mount a defense against that. And what that means is that, that we're going to pay attention to what our children listen to in their music. What are they listening to? Find out. And, and I can tell you right now, if you look at the top 40 and you, you examine lyrics for the top 40, it'll knock your socks off. And your children have no business listening to those things. Not, not if you're trying to raise them in the Lord. You, you've got to control that. And what about, what about videos? What about television? What about, what about downloads? And the answer is the same thing. I bought that computer and I can, I can throw that thing away. We, either we can control it or we've got to get rid of it. Put the computer that's online. Computers that are online need to be in, in public pro places when you have kids, not in private places. And you absolutely must have all the passwords of your children, whatever devices, and wait as long as you can before you get any child a smartphone. Because I can assure you, you put those kids online and give them some privacy, and what will happen is the devil's going to reach out of that phone and grab hold of their hearts. You think that's an exaggeration? It's not. It's not. The average age at which a boy looks at pornography for the first time will be about nine years old. Ready for that? You ready? I'm telling you that he doesn't have to go looking for porn. Porn's going to come looking for him. And once he's addicted, either he will be rescued from that or it's going to affect him negatively for the rest of his life. Dad, you better stay away from porn. 
stay away from porn. And when we talk about modest apparel, boy, I talk about distinguishing our children from the world. And so we gotta distinguish them with their, their, their apparel. We, we're, not, we're not of the world. We're not like that. What Cliff said tonight is just so true. God, God has saved his very, very best for us. Isn't that the truth? It starts though, you wanna, you wanna give your kids a great life. Part of it's going to be that you teach them morality. And so when your daughter is young and she comes and she has a new dress on, dad's the best one in the world to decide what is modest and what is immodest. First of all, because he loves her enough to die for her. And second of all, because he's a man and he, he gets it. A woman, she's a wonderful person and all that, but they don't get it. Not, not like a man gets it. He understands it. When they start dating, you just have, have rules. Make sure that you create rules. Don't be ashamed or embarrassed about that. I know that it's very different. I know that we, we stand out as being very unique, and maybe, maybe your kids will fuss about it sometimes, but that's okay. The truth is that you need to have rules. The rules are like these. This is the curfew. This is when I expect you to be home. And I expect to be able to reach you anytime I, I want to on the telephone. I expect to be able to reach you. And just remember that, that you don't ever go into the house alone with your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Oh, come on, Daddy. Well, well, well he, he, he picked me up and y'all weren't home, but I, I forgot something in the house, so I just had to come back in for a few minutes to get that. And would, so it wasn't a big deal. No, the, no, 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 wait, wait. The rule is, the rule is that you don't go into an empty house, the two of you alone, no matter what. You don't do that. Don't go in, even if there are people in the house, you don't go into your boyfriend or girlfriend's bedroom and close the door. When you're alone in there, you just don't do it. Don't do that. If you don't want to fall down, don't walk in slippery places. I mean, if you don't want to walk in slippery places, yeah, I'll say it right. If you don't want to fall down, don't walk in slippery places. And there's the answer. Parts of the body that are not for looking are also not for touching. Don't sit on your boyfriend's lap. It's an invitation to promiscuity. Don't go swimming with him with a typical bathing suit because... He doesn't have a right to look at you, not now. Stay away from the dances. The very idea that a boy would be 16 years old and he's already going crazy about her and he, now he gets on the dance floor and to the beat of music in that darkened room he watches her. You know what? Parents, we, we're crazy. We're just crazy if we, if we present to them that, that they need to save sex for marriage and then we allow these kinds of things or maybe even in some cases encourage or endorse them. I'm telling you it's crazy. We need to help them. We're, we're the grown-ups and we ought to act like the grown-ups. So we want to build a conscience in them. I've always thought it was interesting in Luke 15 when the prodigal came back he said, Father I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called your son. Well, I mean, I understand how he, he knew that he had sinned against his dad. He'd taken the money and blown it, after all, riotous living. But how did he know that he sinned against heaven? How did he know that? Why did that bother him? He said at first, I've sinned against heaven in your sight. Why did he say that? And the answer is because his daddy had taught him that. His daddy had taught him to have this conscience about, about right and wrong. And that's what we must do. That's what we must do. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wake, uh, wakes but in vain. It's vain for you to rise up early and stay up late to eat the bread of sorrow for, sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hands of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is that man that has his quiver full. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gates. God help us. To raise our children to not be ashamed of who they are and what they are when they're around the enemy. You've been very kind to listen. Is there someone here tonight who wants to obey the gospel? We're going to sing a song of encouragement. That's our custom to sing a song like this at the close and to make it convenient to people to respond if they want to to the Lord's invitation. And that would be such a good time if you're ready to obey the gospel by repentance and confession, and by immersion in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Now would be such a great time for that.
if you are a member of the body, but you need the prayers of the Christians for whatever reason, now would be a good time. We're going to sing a song of encouragement. If you'd like to respond, come as we stand and sing.